greetings to all. I will welcome to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, and my dear friends. You are all welcome. Here is a new New Testament commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Be loyal, be diligent, be compassionate, be courage, and be a life. This is your passiari. We are in Matthew 7. And in this study, I'm going to talk about the king's principles through judgment. The scribes and the Pharisees were guilty of exercising a false judgment about themselves, other people, and even the Lord. Their false righteousness helped to encourage this false judgment. This explains why our Lord closed this important sermon with the discussion of judgment. In it, he discussed three different judgment. One, over judgment, I mean our judgment of ourselves. Chapter 7, the verses 1 to 5. The first principle of judgment is that we begin with ourselves. Jesus did not forbid us to judge others. For careful discrimination is essential in the Christian life. Christian love is not blind. Philippians 1 verses 9 and 10. The person who believes all that he hears and accepts everyone who claims to be spiritual will experience confusion and great spiritual loss. But before we judge others, we must judge ourselves. There are several reasons for this. We shall be judged. Verse 1. The tense of the verb judged signifies a once for all final judgment. If we first judge ourselves, then we are preparing for that final judgment when we face God. The Pharisees played God as they condemned other people but they never considered that God would one day judge them. We are being judged, verse 2. The parallel passages in Luke 6, 37-38 is helpful here. And I hope that for those who are able, have pen and paper to write very important notes down. But as always, You can always go back to this broadcast. So not only will God judge us at the end, but people are also judging us right now. And we receive from people exactly what we give. The kind of judgment and the measure of judgment comes right back to us. We reap what we have sown. We must see clearly to help others, verses 3 to 5. The purpose of self-judgment is to prepare us to our others, to serve others. Christians are obligated to help each other grow in grace. When we do not judge ourselves, we not only hurt ourselves, but we also hurt those to whom we could minister. 
The Pharisees judged and criticized others to make themselves look good. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. But Christians should judge themselves so that they can help others look good. There is a difference. Let's look at our Lord's illustration of this point. Jesus chose to symbolize of the eye. He uses the symbol of the eye because this is one of the most sensitive areas of the human body. The picture of a man with a two by four stuck in his eye trying to remove a speck of dust from another man's eye. It's ridiculous indeed. If we do not honestly face up to our own sins and confess them, we blind ourselves to ourselves, and then we cannot see clearly enough to help others. The Pharisees saw the sins of other people, but they would not look at their own sins in Matthew 6, 22 to 23, Jesus uses the illustration of the eye to teach us how to have a spiritual outlook on life. We must not pass judgment on others' motives. We should examine their actions and attitudes, but we cannot judge their motives, for only God can see their hearts. It is possible for a person to do a good work with a bad motive. It is also possible to fail in a task and yet be very sincerely motivated. When we stand before Christ at the judgment seat, he will examine the secrets of the heart and reward us accordingly. And I give you some scripture verses. Roman 2, 16, and Colossians 3, verses 22 to 25. The image of the eye teaches us another truth. We must exercise love and tenderness when we seek to help others. Ephesians 4, 15. Like eye doctors, we should minister to people who want to help with tender, loving care. We can do more damage than a speck of dirt in the eye if we approach others with impatience and intensity. Two extremes must be avoided in this matter of spiritual self-examination. And the first is the deception of a shallow examination. Sometimes we are so sure of ourselves that we fail to examine our hearts honestly and thoroughly. A quick glance into the mirror of the word will never reveal the true situation. James 1, 22 to 25. The second extreme is what I call a perpetual autopsy. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in self-examination that we become unbalanced. But we should not look only at ourselves or we will become discouraged and defeated. We should look by faith to Jesus Christ and let him forgive and restore us. Satan is the accuser, and he enjoys it when we accuse and condemn ourselves. Revelation 12, verse 10. After we have judged ourselves honestly before God and have removed those things that blind us, 
then we can help others and properly judge their works. But if we don't know there are sins in our lives and we try to help others, we are hypocrites. In fact, it is possible for ministry to be a device to cover up sin. The Pharisees were guilty of this and Jesus denounced them for it. Second, our judgment of others. Chapter 7, the verses 6 to 20. Christians must exercise discernment, for not everyone is a sheep. Some people are dogs or hogs, and some are wolves in sheep clothing. We are the Lord's sheep. But this does not mean we should let people pull the wool over our eyes. The reason we must judge is in verse 7, I mean verse 6 in that chapter 7. As God's people, we are privileged to handle the holy things of God. He has entrusted to us the precious truth of the word of God, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, and we must regard them carefully. No dedicated priest would throw meat from the altar to a filthy dog. And only a fool would give pearls to a pig. While it is true that we must carry the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, verse 15, it is also true that we must not cheapen the gospel by a ministry that lacks discernment. Even Jesus refused to talk to Herod, Luke 23, verse 9. And Paul refused to argue with people who resist the word, Acts 13, 44 to 49. The reason for judgment, then, is not that we might condemn others, but that we might be able to minister to them. Notice that Jesus always dealt with individuals according to their needs and their spiritual condition. He did not have a memorized speech that he used with everybody. He discussed a new birth with Nicodemus, but he spoke of living water to the Samaritan woman. When the religious leaders tried to trap him, he refused to answer their questions. Matthew 21, 23 to 27. It is a wise Christian who first assesses the condition of a person's heart before sharing the precious pearls. The resources God gives us Verses 7 to 11. Why did our Lord discuss prayer at this point in his message? These verses seem to be an interruption, but they are not. You and I are human and fallible. We make mistakes. Only God can judge perfectly. And therefore, we must pray and seek his wisdom and direction. If any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of God. James 1 verse 5. Young King Solomon knew that he lacked the needed wisdom to judge Israel. And so he prayed to God. And the Lord graciously answered. 
If we are to have spiritual discernment, we must keep on asking God, keep on seeking His will, keep on knocking at the door that leads to greater ministry. God meets the needs of His children. The Guiding Principle, verse 12. This is the so-called golden rule, one of the most misunderstood statements in the Bible. This statement is not the sum total of Christian truth, nor is it God's plan of redemption. We should no more build our theology on the golden rule then we should build our astronomy on twinkle twinkle little star this great truth is a principle that ought to govern our attitude toward others it only applies to believers and it must be practiced in every area of life The person who practices the golden rule refuses to say or do anything that would harm himself or others. If our judging of others is not governed by this principle, we will become proud and critical and our own spiritual character will degenerate. degenerate. Practicing the golden rule releases the love of God in our lives and enable us to help others, even those who want to hurt us. But remember that practicing the golden rule means paying a price. If we want God's best for ourselves and others, but others resist God's will, then they will oppose us. We are salt, and salt stings the open wound. We are light, and light exposes dirt. The basis for judgment, verses 13 to 20. Since there are false prophets in the world, we must be careful of deception. But the greatest danger is self-deception. The scribes and Pharisees had fooled themselves into believing that they were righteous and others were sinful. It is possible for people to know the right language, believe intellectually the right doctrines, obey the right rules, and still not be saved. Jesus used two pictures to help us judge ourselves and others. The two ways, 13 and 14. These are, of course, the way to heaven and the way to hell. The broad way is the easy way. It is the popular way. But we must not judge spiritual profession by statistics. The majority is not always right. The fact that everybody does it is no proof that what they are doing is right. Quite the contrary is true. God's people have always been a remnant, a small minority, I mean minority in this world. The reason is not difficult to discover. The way of life is narrow, lonely, and costly. We can walk on the broad way and keep our baggage of sin and world lines. But if we enter the narrow way, we must give up those things. Here then is the first test. Did your profession of faith in Christ cost you anything? If not then it was not a true profession. 
Many people who trust Jesus Christ never leave the broad road with its appetite and associations. They have an easy Christian Christianity that makes no demands on them. Yet Jesus said that the narrow way is hard. We cannot walk on two roads in two different directions at the same time. The two trees, 15 to 20. These show that true faith in Christ changes the life and produces fruit for God's glory. Everything in nature reproduces after its kind, and this is also true in the spiritual realm. Good fruit comes from a good tree, but bad fruit comes from a bad tree. The tree that produces rotten fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 7, 20. The second test is this. Did my decision for Christ change my life? False prophets who teach false doctrine can produce only a false righteousness. See Acts 20, 29 for that. Their fruit, the results of their ministry, is false and cannot last. The prophets themselves are false. The closer we get to them, the more we see the falsity of their lives and doctrines. They magnify themselves, not Jesus Christ. And their purpose is to exploit people, not to edify them. The person who believes false doctrine or who follows a false prophet will never experience a changed life. Unfortunately, some people do not realize this until it is too late. Three. God's judgment of us. Matthew 7, 21 to 29. From picturing two ways and two trees, our Lord closed his message by picturing two builders and their houses. The two ways illustrate the start of the life of faith, and the two trees illustrate the growth and results of life, of faith, here and now. And the two houses illustrate the end of this life of faith. When God shall call everything to judgment, there are false prophets of the gate that leads to the broad way, making it easy for people to enter. But at the end of the way, there is destruction. The final test is not what we think of ourselves or what others may think. The final test is, what will God say? How can we prepare for judgment? By doing God's will. Obedience to his will is a test of true faith in Christ. The test is not words, not saying, Lord, Lord, and not obeying his commands. How easy it is to learn a religious vocabulary and even memorize his Bible verses and religious songs and yet not obey God's will. When a person is truly born again, he has the Spirit of God living within, and the Spirit enables him to know and to do Father's will. God's love in his heart motivates him to obey God and serve others. Words are not a substitute for obedience, and neither are religious works. Preaching 
casting out demons and performing miracles can be divinely inspired where they give no assurance of salvation. It is likely that even Judas participated in some or all of these activities, and yet he was not a true believer. In the last days, Satan will use lying wonders to deceive people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the verses 7 to 12. We are to hear God's word and do them. We must not stop with only hearing or studying his words. Our hearing must result in doing. This is what it means to build on the rock foundation. We should not confuse the symbol with the rock in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. Paul founded the local church in Corinth. on Jesus Christ when he preached the gospel and won people to Christ. This is the only foundation for a local church. The foundation in this parable is obedience to God's word. Obedience that is an evidence of true faith. James 2.14 The two men in the story had much in common. Both had desires to build a house. Both built houses that looked good and sturdy. But when the judgment came, the storm, one of the houses collapsed. What was the difference? Not the mere external looks, to be sure. The difference was in the foundation. The successful builder digged deep and set his house on a solid foundation. A false profession will last until judgment comes. Sometimes, this judgment is in the form of the trials of life. Like the person who received the seed of God's word into a shallow heart, the commitment fails when the testing comes. Many people have professed faith in Christ, only to deny their faith when life becomes spiritual, costly, and difficult. But the judgment illustrates here probably refers to the final judgment before God. We must not read into the parable all the doctrine that we thought in the epistles. For the Lord was illustrating one main point, Profession will ultimately be tested before God. Those who have trusted Christ and have proved their faith by their obedience will have nothing to fear. Their house is founded on the rock and it will stand. But those who have professed to to trust Christ yet who have not obeyed God's will will be condemned. How shall we test our profession of faith? By popularity? No. For there are many on the broad road to destruction, and there are many who are depending on words, saying, Lord, Lord. But there is no assurance of salvation. Even religious activities in a church organization are no assurance. How then shall we judge ourselves and others who profess Christ as Savior? The two ways tells us to examine the cost of our profession. Have we paid a price to profess faith in Christ? The two trees tells us the investigated tells us to investigate whether our lives have really changed. Are there godly fruits from our lives? And the two houses remind us that true faith in Christ will last, not only in the storms of life, but also in the final judgment. 
The congregation was astonished at this sermon. Why? Because Jesus spoke with divine authority. The scribes and Pharisees spoke from authorities, always quoting the various rabbis and experts of the law. Jesus needed no human teacher to add authority to his words, for he spoke as the Son of God. We cannot lightly dismiss this sermon, for it is God who gave it to us. We must bow before him and submit to his authority, or we will be condemned. Let me give you some questions for personal reflections or when you use this to study with a group. Why do Christians need to judge themselves? Another one, the view of many religious people is that none of us has any right to judge other people. Do you agree? Why or why not? Another one, How could spiritual self-examination or judgment be bad when misused? What does the golden rule have to do with judging others? How do cost and life change tells us if a person is truly a child of God? What kind of fruit does a true Christian produce? The final test of lives is not what we think of ourselves or what others think of us. How do we pass the test? How is the story of the wise and foolish builders a good picture of the church today? The King's Principles Through Judgment May God bless your heart, my dear ones. May the Holy Spirit guide you through your life as you walk and abiding in Christ. This is your Pastor Yeti.